here in Rico Fermi. The answer is simple. There is only us in the galaxy. As Arthur C. Clarke said, there are two possibilities. Either we are alone in the universe or we are not. Both are equally terrifying. The Italian physicist Enrico Fermi went even further, making our minds almost certain that the first hypothesis is much more probable than the other. Among his other merits, the Nobel Prize winner Enrico Fermi was esteemed for his extraordinary ability to go straight to the heart of a problem and then be able to describe it in its real essence. Impressive was his way to estimate the order of magnitude of a numerical value related to a given phenomenon from almost nothing, often by performing complex calculations in his mind. Fermi tried to impress this ability on his students, so much so that he used to ask without warning seemingly unanswered questions. How many grains of sand are there on the world's beaches? How far can a crow fly without stopping? How many atoms of Caesar's last breath do we inhale every time we fill our lungs? How many piano tuners are there in Chicago? These Fermi questions forced students to propose rough estimates drawing on their knowledge of the world and their daily experience, rather than on theoretical or prior knowledge. One day in the summer of 1950, Fermi was in Los Alamos in the company of colleagues such as Edward Teller, Herbert York, and Emmy Konopinski. Together, they walked to a nearby restaurant, amiably discussing the recent spate of flying saucer sightings that had spread across the country. After a few jokes, the conversation turned serious, and the four colleagues wondered whether or not the flying saucers could exceed the speed of light. Fermi asked Teller what he thought was the probability of having confirmation of the possibility of superluminal travel by 1960. His friend's answer, one chance in a million, did not convince him. It was too low. According to him, it was closer to one in ten. The four sat down at the table and the talk turned to lighter topics. Then, in the middle of the conversation, as if it had rained down from the sky, Fermi asked, but then where is everyone? His diners immediately understood that he was still referring to the issue of extraterrestrial visitors. And since it was Fermi who was speaking, they realized that the question was more complex and profound than it first seemed. York recalls that Fermi made a series of quick calculations and concluded that if aliens really existed, we should have been visited a long time ago and more than once. A result that immediately answered his question. There are no extraterrestrial intelligences in this galaxy, and perhaps in the entire universe, we are alone. And if you don't like the idea, let's at least try to think about it a bit. Let's put aside the billions of galaxies in the universe, each of which is home to trillions of planets, and focus only on our galaxy, the Milky Way. The number of planets that compose it is around 100 billion. Of these, even if the estimates vary a lot and the detailed list is much more concise, about 1 billion are potentially habitable. If even 0.1% hosted some form of life, we would still be talking about a million planets inhabited by aliens, from the little green men of the collective imagination to some modest bacterium. So how is it that we don't find anyone? As we know, this is the heart of the Fermi Paradox. We are surrounded by billions of planets that host life forms, but we have never crossed them. Not only that, no extraterrestrial has ever even found us. It is a question of logic. Homo sapiens, for the times of the universe, is a very recent species. Which makes it plausible that elsewhere there's some species technologically superior to our. And since we are looking for other forms of life, it is plausible that others have already done so and are still doing it. So why doesn't anyone send us any signals? All of our knowledge of terrestrial life indicates that life has a natural tendency to expand throughout the space available to it. Why should extraterrestrial life behave differently? A technologically advanced alien civilization could colonize the galaxy in a few million years. So it should already be here. The galaxy should be teeming with life. The reason for this belief is very simple. If one of these civilizations sent colonizing spaceships to nearby stars at a speed equal to one-tenth the speed of light, 0.1c, and if the colonies in turn sent their ships, that civilization should be able to colonize the galaxy in a very negligible time compared to the age of the universe. If the ships did not take breaks between the different voyages, there would be a wave of colonization that spreads through the galaxy at a speed of 0.1c. If the interval between voyages were instead as long as the voyage itself, after all, travelers need to settle on the planet they just landed on before setting off other ships. The wave would move to 0.05c, so it could travel from one end of the galaxy to the other in a time ranging from 0.6 to 1.2 million years. 
To simplify the discussion, we can assume that it takes a million years to colonize the galaxy. A million years is a long period on a personal level, and it is also long at the level of an entire species. But it is nothing compared to the total time available for colonization. Yet as far as we know so far, there is no trace of these colonizers. And in the face of this bitter observation, all that remains is to take note of our uniqueness as a sentient animal species. In reality, these arguments are played on the opposition of two concepts always in conflict with each other, called hypothesis of the rarity of the earth and hypothesis of the principle of mediocrity. The hypothesis of the rarity of the Earth argues that the emergence of life on our planet required an extremely unlikely combination of astrophysical and geological events and circumstances. The hypothesis is opposed to the principle of mediocrity, an extension of the Copernican principle, that the Earth would be just a typical rocky planet in a typical planetary system, located in a non-special region of a large but common spiral galaxy. Stephen Hawking himself stated one day that we are nothing more than an advanced species of apes on a planet less than a mediocre star, a vision that is very different from the exceptionality with which man has always looked at himself. But not all experts think like the recently deceased astrophysicist, the director of the Columbia Astrobiological Center Caleb Scharf, overturned Hawking's thesis in his 2014 book, The Copernicus Complex, showing how the sun, in truth, it is not at all mediocre and how much the architecture of our solar system is very particular. A similar thesis was supported by astrophysicist John Gribben in his essay, Alone in the Universe. According to Gribben, life on Earth was made possible by a chain of extremely unlikely coincidences, starting with the fact that it took 4 billion years for life on Earth to pass from the primordial soup to the first multicellular forms, an incredibly long and complex process. The entire universe is 13.8 billion years, during which thousands of things could have gone wrong and instead led miraculously to the incredible variety of life we know today. In short, our planet would have nothing mediocre at all. Indeed, it could even be the only one in which the entire evolutionary process has ended up generating sentient beings capable of reasoning about themselves and understanding the universe. Do you want proof? Here is a list of some of the necessary conditions that within a few billion years have allowed the Earth to fill with life and you to be here watching this video. A single star to orbit around. Binary or multiple star systems would give rise to planets with chaotic or unstable orbits. An ordered planetary system. There can be no planets of great mass in very elliptical or closely spaced orbits. A very frequent situation in the case of exoplanets known today, capable of destabilizing the set of orbits. A clean interplanetary environment. There can be no excess of orbiting solid matter because collisions would be too frequent and destructive. A second generation parent star. These stars, like our Sun, were formed by incorporating the heavy metals released by the explosion of older stars. Without metals in the core of our planet, the dynamo capable of forming the magnetic shield that allows the Earth to defend itself from cosmic rays and the solar wind would not have been activated. Adequate mass. A low-mass planet could not hold back its atmosphere, which, like Mars, would be dispersed into space. The existence of plate tectonics. Some researchers believe that without the movement of continents, life would not have evolved into complex forms. The continual shuffling of the Earth's mantle allows methane and other compounds to escape through thermal springs on the ocean floor, which would otherwise be sterile. Tectonic activity also plays an essential role in maintaining the long-term stability of the Earth's thermostat. Let us consider the case of carbon dioxide. A planet with too much carbon dioxide would end up like Venus, a planetary blast furnace. The activity of the plates on Earth helps to regulate their level. The presence of the Moon. Without the Moon, life on Earth could never have reached too high a level of complexity. Our planet would have been a very, very different place. Without the Moon to slow down, an Earth day would only last 8 to 10 hours. The faster rotation would have produced winds of 160 to 200 kilometers per hour. The inclination of the Earth's axis would have oscillated by as much as 90 degrees, causing extreme variations in temperature over thousands or millions of years, which is what happened to Mars without a sufficiently large moon. 
And although our seas would still have had tides, these would have been smaller, produced only by the sun, and they would not have been able to continually stir the seabed, ensuring the necessary exchange of oxygen and nutrients. And finally, if we had not been enticed by the presence of an affordable goal, close enough to be reached in a few days of travel, and sufficiently hospitable to allow humans to walk on it, what future would space exploration have? Would we have invested equally as much in the technology and skills that led to the creation of a space station where men and women can live for months, and to human exploration projects of Mars and other remote places in the solar systems? Without the Apollo missions, we would not have all the information we now have on our satellite. But above all, perhaps the stimulus and enthusiasm to begin the quest of deep space would have been lacking. But these that we have briefly listed are just some of the requisites necessary for the emergence of an intelligent and technological civilization. Probably, in the absence of even one of these characteristics, our Earth would now contain only traces of primordial life. Which leads us to think that for us it was like winning a large lottery for a considerable number of consecutive times. How many in our galaxy could have had the same luck as us? Maybe nobody else. The famous French biologist Jacques Monod wrote one day that man finally knows he is alone in the indifferent immensity of the universe from which he was born by chance. It is a rather melancholy thought, but sadder still is the thought that the possibility offered to us by chance could be badly wasted. If we survive, we will have a galaxy to explore and make ours. If we destroy ourselves, if we ruin our home planet before we're ready to leave it, well, it could be a long, long time before an individual of another species looks up at their planet's night sky and wonders, where is everyone?